The nomination of Louis Brandeis is one of the deepest wounds I have had as an American and a lover of the Constitution. This man is essentially a striver after change and reform. In 1916, Louis Brandeis is almost 60 years old at this point. He had been there and done that on just about every major reform of the progressive era. Wilson hopes to capture the large Jewish vote in New York through this gross manipulation of patronage. Wilson fancied himself a progressive. Brandeis was a progressive. It seemed a very logical thing to put him on to the court. Now, the fact that he was a Jew was a bit of a problem because there had never been a Jew on the Supreme Court. I hold nothing against Brandeis or being Jewish. Rather, the Bostonian is an opportunist who has only embraced Judaism and Zionism to further his own political ambitions. The passion of that uh, dispute and the powers that were brought to bear to try to thwart his nomination make any of the recent nomination battles seem tame. Admirable in every way, a real progressive with profound knowledge of the law. He is guilty of infidelity, breach of faith, and unprofessional conduct. Certain to prove one of the great jurists that has ever sat on the Supreme Bench. Ruthless, not to be trusted. I don't think that the bombshell that the Brandeis nomination is reported to have been was due to his having been a Jew. It was due to the fact that here was somebody who was seen as something of a radical. He was radical in the sense that he was not afraid to take on power, and he was very effective at taking on power. A radical economically, a radical in his ideas about social justice, somebody who stood up to the establishment and had done so repeatedly. What he was asking was that corporations, big business, live up to a fairly high standard. He was not a communist, he was not a socialist, he wasn't opposed to free enterprise. But anybody who attacked business for any reason was a radical. This program is made possible by a grant from the Savings Bank Life Insurance Company of Massachusetts. Honoring the past, protecting the future. Louis Brandeis was born in 1856 in Louisville. His first memories, his earliest memories, were his mother serving food and coffee to Union soldiers on his front yard. I remember helping my mother carry out food and coffee to the men from the north. The streets seemed full of them always. But there were times when the rebels came so near, we could hear the firing. I think that earliest memory says a lot about Brandeis because he uh, was so influenced by his family in the character. I mean, the fact that serving was the first thing he remembered doing. Uh, his whole life was about service to others. Two dozen members of the extended Brandeis family had immigrated to America in 1849. Like so many others, they sought economic opportunity and freedom. They eventually settled in Louisville with other Jews. I think that modern Americans view the Jewish experience as being an East Coast and Northern phenomena. But prior to the Civil War, most Jews lived in the South. 19th century Louisville's an exciting place to be. It's a, a booming town. Most of the Jewish community came here along with the Germans who came around 1848 and a few years before, looking for democracy and looking forward to the opportunity of being involved in it. Louisville Jewish life is uniquely Western or Midwestern. It's, um, there aren't any rabbis here, so they make up the rules as they go along. Judaism meant something to them, but what it meant to them was not ritual and observance. Actually, I think they were largely opposed to any ritual or observance in that, in that context. And they were proud to be Jews, and many of those with whom they interacted were Jewish, uh, but it did not have a religious component to it. Certainly no interest in Jewish holidays or in the Jewish dietary laws or in observance of the Jewish Sabbath, but on the other hand, a religion that is deeply 
uh, interested in the inculcation of high moral values. That's what's critical. Those values included a strong belief in abolitionism, a deeply unpopular view in the South. They had African Americans who uh, worked in their homes and, and in their businesses, but they, you know, they paid them, they hired them, and they treated them as any other human being. And they took a great deal of pride in that. And I think that they saw that as part of the living of the social justice that their Jewish heritage had handed to them. Louis Brandeis was the youngest in the family. He was closest to his mother, Frederica. In family life, things revolved around Frederica. Not in a bad sense, you know, she wasn't a domineering parent who, you know, took up all the space. But she certainly, um, at least in Louis's eyes, provided him with the idealism and values that he cherished later. I believe, most beloved mother, that the improvement of the world can only arise when mothers like you are increased thousands of times and have more children. It was from her that he seems to have gotten his sense that all human beings are important and that every human being has the responsibility of doing something for the society in which he or she lives. Louis developed a special bond with his older brother Alfred, which lasted a lifetime. He and Alfred were quite close, and they weren't in competition with one another. Alfred probably could have been a success in almost any field, but at the time that he should have gone on to school was when the family had financial reverses, the Depression of 73. So Alfred stayed and went into the family business. It was Louis that went off to law school. And um, the two of them conversed through writing letters. They were their best friends. Dear Al, I trust that Amy's convalescence is proceeding satisfactorily. You must have had quite a scare, despite the modern advances in medical science. Thanks for the data on grain freights. The talk here on railroad finances is very dark. The date tells me that your wedding day is nearly upon us, and I must send my good wishes. I miss you. Your brother, Louis. Louis Brandeis entered Harvard Law School in 1875, after three years of private schooling in Europe. He discovered that he could function well no matter what life threw at him. For example, one of the things that happened was that his eyesight started to fail. My eyes have been troublesome ever since last spring. I am able to use them hardly three or four hours. And he went to see one doctor who said, you have to give up the law. Brandeis was not about to do that. He went to see another doctor who said, you have to give up the law. Brandeis was insistent, no, there must be another way to do this. And he went to a third doctor who said, read less, think more. And at that point, Brandeis said, fine, I will have my classmates read to me. And so he did. And eventually, he regained his eyesight. But in the process of having his classmates read to him, he developed a phenomenal memory. Brandeis graduated from Harvard Law in 1877 with one of the highest grade averages in the history of the school. He was only 20 years old. He had grown to love his Boston environs, and his ambition led him to settle here, home of the Brahmins and what was considered to be the Athens of America. It was a very progressive place politically. The citizens of Boston were interested in school reform, prison reform, uh, laws that would protect women workers, laws that would protect child workers, all of this, we're talking about the 1870s here. This is way ahead of much of the rest of the country, and Brandeis certainly responded to that. And he felt at home with progressive Boston Puritans, who shared common ideals with recent Jewish immigrants. Both Jews and Puritans have this sense of responsibility for the community in which they live and for the moral and ethical standards of the community in which they live the fervent uh, uh, commitment to religious freedom, um, and the fact that many Jews, though not all, many Jews came to this country for religious freedom, 
Um, many Puritans came to this country for religious freedom. They understood religious persecution on a, uh, on a deep level, and they respected it. And for the upper crust Brahmins of Boston, Brandeis wasn't just any Jew. He was charming, had studied in Europe, and had gone to Harvard. Brandeis has a rather foreign look and is believed to have Jew blood in him, though you would not know it from his appearance. Tall, well-made, dark, with the brightest eyes I ever saw. William E. Cushing, Harvard classmate. So he is, in a sense, their ideal. Yes, he's Jewish, but he has cast off um, uh, that which might, to their mind, make Jews objectionable. He doesn't look any different. He doesn't uh, observe peculiar uh, rituals. He, uh, if anything, is prophetic. On the other hand, uh, even Brandeis is kept out of certain social clubs because he is Jewish and he knows it. One of his many Brahmin friends was a Harvard classmate, Samuel Warren. Sam Warren came from a very wealthy family in Boston. And Sam Warren liked and, much more importantly, respected Brandeis and they opened up their own uh, law firm of uh, Warren and Brandeis. My connection with Warren promises well. There are many fine points about the man, both in mind and in character. And it looks to me as if he would be a success. I like his push and obstinacy and his ambition. We have taken a room, number 60 Devonshire Street. The room is only $200 a year. Very cheap, everyone says. going to all these parties, they're, have, they're bachelors, they're having a great time, they're building a law practice, it's very exciting. It's everything that he wants. Warren introduced Brandeis to others in Boston's high society, another lawyer, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., and a particularly wealthy Brahmin, Henry Lee Higginson. Henry Lee Higginson was a Boston banker, a Boston philanthropist. He bankrolled the Boston Symphony, for example. He was the son of the, one of the great families of Boston, the Cabot family. And initially, he and his wife were quite enchanted with Brandeis. Brandeis was actually a guest in their home. The ideas of Higginson and the ideas of Brandeis went quite different directions. Higginson remained convinced that what the country needed was concentrations of capital, particularly his capital. Using contacts from Warren's family, which ran a successful paper company, the firm of Warren and Brandeis opened in 1879, just as the role of lawyers in the business of America was changing. In terms of the practice of law up until the 1870s, 1880s, most lawyers in this country were solo practitioners, and they did everything. They were generalists. Also, you didn't go to a lawyer until you needed one. Well, after the Civil War, business got complicated. And so a new type of lawyer who might be called a counselor, an advisor develops who knew business, who knew economics. Initially, Brandeis and Warren struggled. Our fiscal year ends today. It shows $3,000 net profit. The outlook for the next year is not good. I suppose we shall pull through. I don't expect our practice to amount to much over the next 15 years. Brandeis's office was simple, his manner direct. One thing that strikes me was how efficient he was about uh, dealing with clients because his office was on the cold side. He actually had kind of an uncomfortable chair that the client would come in and sit in. And he would be ushered into the office exactly on time and he would meet with the client and be ushered out. So there was no time wasted. I, I don't imagine him being a chit chat person in a client setting. And uh, he would get to the heart of the matter. And if he thought he would not take the case if he did not think the cause was just. Brandeis had a very interesting approach to the law. 
And his approach as a lawyer was, you don't hire me, I decide whether I want to take you on. And he said, I don't want to be somebody's lawyer, I will choose my clients. He chose his clients on the basis of whether or not he considered their concerns to be worthy. It was a rather unique role, which he performed very well, but it uh, ruffled quite a few feathers by people who thought, well, he's supposed to be representing me, and he said, no, I'm representing the situation. I'm trying to be fair to everyone. Contrary to Brandeis's initial worries, the firm quickly flourished. By 1890, he had argued his first case before the United States Supreme Court and he was earning more than $50,000 a year. He was a prosperous private lawyer who gave no indication that he would become one of the leading reformers of his day. He was very successful, he was very focused, had a brilliant memory, and I think what really sets the best lawyers apart is their analytic mind. Dear Mother, Friday evening I dined at the Emerton's. One lady I found extremely interesting. She is tall, has a finely chiseled face with sparkling jet eyes. I had hardly sat myself next to her when she started talking about mutual acquaintances with remarkable variations of character and soul. Her conversation was of unusual character and quality. You, of course, are very much interested in this young lady because you think I am smitten with her. But alas, it is not so. One mistress only claims me. The law has her grip on me, and I suppose I can't escape her clutches. Brandeis enjoyed the company of women, and he respected them, but he did not believe that they had a right to vote. Dear Al, I've had a public career of late, lectured against taxation Sunday, and spoke against women's suffrage before the Legislative Committee on Tuesday. He started out very much a man of his times. And in the 1880s, a man of his times in the United States would think that women's suffrage was pretty ridiculous. The idea that women could would not be dependent, the idea that women could participate in political life, that was pretty far out. And so in 1884, we have Brandeis actually speaking before a legislative committee against women's suffrage. Very, very common. The constant socializing by Warren and Brandeis led to Warren's engagement to the daughter of an important senator. It was big news in Boston. The press in Boston was very excited about that, and they tried to get all details. Uh, there's a report that at least one reporter tried to crash into the home where one of the events was being held. And Brandeis and Warren became a little bit concerned about this whole notion of privacy or lack of privacy. Sam Warren was upset with the coverage that his family was getting in the local press and that he was concerned about stories that were circulating about him. And he asked, said to Brandeis and was upset about it. And Sam Warren was, from everything I've read, a very sensitive man. Warren was so upset, he urged his friend to co-author an article for the Harvard Law Review about a citizen's right to privacy. Brandeis, a private man himself, agreed. It would set a precedent and add a new chapter to legal history. They wrote an article about privacy being a basic part of civilized existence and what they called the right to be let alone. Now, they framed it in terms of the media. But the interesting thing about what happened to their idea was that it became part of American constitutional law later on. The Warren and Brandeis article, up until the end of World War II, was the most cited article in legal history. The reason for that is that while the concept of privacy may be behind some of the articles in the Constitution, the word privacy is not to be found there. It took Brandeis and Warren to say, yes, it is in effect so much a part of the way we organize society that it must be there. And so ultimately, the Supreme Court 
as well as other parts of our government, would adopt their idea and say the right to be let alone applies not only to the right of the individual against the media, but the right of the individual against the government. While his professional life continued to be a success, there were some problems in the family. His sister Fanny, after suffering periodic bouts of depression, took her own life. The loss of his sister brought him to the woman who would become his wife. During the trip to the funeral, he became reacquainted with a second cousin, Alice Goldmark. She was from the same kind of world that Brandeis came from, the daughter of American-German immigrants, very cultured, very interested in the world of ideas, a great reader, very interested in social reform. He wrote to Alice constantly, one time writing about the sadness of his sister Fanny's suicide, while his brother-in-law, Charlie Nagel, sat nearby, inconsolable. My dear Alice, Charlie is by my side. Fanny's spirit surrounds us, and their ideal love brings me nearer to Charlie now. He has been with me since yesterday, and to him, I could speak of you as I speak to no other. There is so much to say of Fanny and you. How I long to be with you, to ask and to tell all that concerns us both. To think that you are mine, that I should know so little of my treasure. I see us living so beautifully together. Charlie is sitting on the bed. The tears show in his eyes, as they have done so much since yesterday. Poor fellow, how he suffers at the thought of his loss. At the turn of the century, Brandeis was 43 years old, a resounding success and the darling of Boston and its Brahmins. But something was missing. What was he going to do for the next 20 or 30 years? He loved the law, and there were always new challenges there, but it wasn't enough. Um, he wanted to do something to give back. Most people who achieve that kind of acceptance and that kind of success are not going to give it up. Uh, they're going to keep doing it. But uh, one of the things that I think made Brandeis unique and admirable is his capacity to grow. I think we can go back to his mother here to some extent. The notion that one had to serve as well as achieve, well, he had achieved. He was a millionaire by the end of the 19th century. As America was industrializing, Brandeis believed that the law was favoring large corporations and not working men and women. He had friends, colleagues who would bring matters to his attention, uh, women's working hours, uh, labor issues. He was really ready to take those on because he believed in the cause. He believed in the individual, the common person, and those were values that he'd had from the beginning. And he had the freedom to do that because he had money. There was nobody who was representing the people, so to speak, nobody representing the public interest. And so he stood out as being very unusual at the time, as somebody who would take on these causes, often for free. One of his first cases on behalf of the public involved trolley fares. A backroom deal had been cut by the Massachusetts legislature with a private company to build trolley lines and control public transportation in Boston. The deal would lock in a minimum fare of no less than five cents a hefty sum for a worker earning only a dollar a day. Brandeis found out about it, and he and some of his fellow social reformers, if we may call them that, in Boston, mounted a very large fight against the proposed deal. He thought the terms that the builders of these roads were asking of the city was extortionate. And who was going to pay for it? Well, the people would pay for it. Ultimately, they lost. However, they learned how to go about such a fight. A few years later, the situation reoccurred as a new subway line was being built. A long-term contract was being considered, and rumors were rife about yet another backroom deal. This time, 
Brandeis knew what to do. He gathered his facts, enlisted the support of important businessmen, orchestrated a large media campaign, and took his fight to the Massachusetts legislature, where he won on behalf of the working man. And what he would end up calling that whole fight was his introduction into the world of public affairs and public service, his introduction into what would become Brandeis as the people's attorney. Some men buy diamonds in rare works of art. Others delight in automobiles and yachts. My luxury is to invest my surplus effort to the pleasure of taking up a problem and solving it for the people without receiving any compensation. What isn't as well known is that he reimbursed the firm that he worked for for the time that he would have if he had been having a paying client. And so he paid back the firm for the time that they lost from his work. This goes on to the point where in one of his crusades, he actually is paying his law firm $50,000 because he's using some of their resources and he says his partners should not suffer. This strikes a number of people as very odd. I mean, the idea of pro bono work is brand new. Brandeis practically invents it. All this reform work on behalf of the common man was making his Brahmin friends nervous, even angry, and they began to turn against their friend. You can't understand Brandeis outside of Boston. Someone once said he was more Brahmin than the Brahmins, and by that they meant that he had imbibed this whole Puritan moral system. And he had a, a sense that people who had privilege, who had wealth, who had power, had to use it for the benefit of everyone, not just for their own selfish interests. And I think one of the reasons that he becomes an outcast in Boston society is that he is essentially throwing their own values into their face saying, you are not living up to what you preach. And this coming from what they considered an outsider and a Jew uh, did not sit well. In 1905, a bitter fight with even more at stake. The proposed merger of the Boston and Maine Railroad with the New Haven Railroad. The battle stretched on for years and pitted him not only against his old friend, Henry Lee Higginson, but also against J.P. Morgan himself. What he objected to was the fact that they were not being honest, which to him as a Puritan was the first thing. You know, the, the books were cooked. Uh, they were lying to the people. They were cheating the investors. They were not uh, maintaining the railroads. They were saving money by scrimping on safety. Infuriating the Brahmins even more, Brandeis didn't like monopolies and he believed that the concentration of capital was not good for America. Economics was not just about economics, it was about morals as well. And he believed almost from the start that monopoly was economically never a good thing. Because if you had a monopoly, there was no way to stop you from raising your prices, from manipulating the market and doing other things. And he came to feel that big concentrations of capital such as those that were enjoyed by some of the Boston Brahmins were not a good thing for the country, not a good thing for the workers. So, of course, the Brahmins thought that he had turned against them. Brandeis, who was becoming more and more famous in Boston as the people's attorney, now took on some of the richest corporations in the United States, the insurance companies. Taken together, the money invested by these companies affected half the population of the United States, and their cash cow was something known as industrial life insurance. It was term insurance that people sold house to house, agents went house to house in poor neighborhoods, collected 25 cents a week. In 1905, as many as 20,000 insurance salesmen were collecting premiums on more than 15 million industrial life insurance policies. If you missed even a week's payment, the policy would lapse. So these policies had a huge lapse rate, which meant that just about everything coming in as uh, a premium was profit for the company. 
Whenever slightly bad times hit, the industrial workers would not be able to keep up the payments. So that apparently over 60% of these policies went into default within three years. That meant that the insurance companies had a phenomenal windfall. Brandeis gets called in when it turns out that the executives of several insurance companies uh, were using the company's funds as sort of a private bank. It was um, a little bit like Enron, except they weren't bankrupting because there was so much money, these insurance companies were like money machines. But they were diverting hundreds of thousands of dollars, essentially, to private interests, houses, diamonds for their wives, expensive parties, what have you. And once again, Henry Lee Higginson, Brandeis's former friend, was now his foe. Well, Higginson's bank would have been involved. I mean, insurance companies were large sources of revenues that could then be diverted to investments. And so bankers like Higginson would be on the boards of some of these companies. They would have a say in where investments were going, and essentially they were turning a blind eye to what the day-to-day -day managers were doing in terms of uh, lining their own pockets. The major factor was Brandeis was holding up a standard of morality and telling people like Higginson, you don't measure up to it anymore. An investigation into the insurance companies was being run by two powerful men in New York State, Senator William Armstrong and Charles Evans Hughes, a tough investigator. Their investigation found extensive fraud, including a slush fund to pay off state lawmakers. But in the end, the insurance companies convinced the investigators that, corruption aside, the policies could not be sold any cheaper. Disheartened, the commission dissolved, with no remedy for the working man. There is a countercurrent of dissatisfaction among Hughes's admirers who think he is leaving his job unfinished. But Brandeis would not give up. He rarely confronted evil without proposing a solution, and this one was particularly creative. He turned to savings banks and filed legislation which would allow them to sell low-cost life insurance which would not automatically default when a payment was missed. For workmen, it's a great deal because when they come in to save, uh, their policies, you can skip a payment if you have to and then catch up on it. At the same time, He's opened a savings account, so the banks are happy. This has brought new customers to them. But being conservative, as bankers are supposed to be, they're a little bit leery, and Brandeis has to do two things here, one of which he has to convince the banks that this is not a risk to them. Secondly, he's got to convince the legislature to pass the enabling legislation in the face of very stiff opposition from big insurance companies and this is when he forms the first true citizens lobby. In the State House, Brandeis went head to head against the insurance companies. He went on a media blitz, enlisted the support of labor leaders, ministers, and community leaders. The way he brought law and politics together was really a thing of wonder. He understood that the law had to move, but he understood that politics might be necessary to get it on the train. Higginson and the insurance companies frantically fought back, but Brandeis and his lobby ultimately prevailed. Brandeis outmaneuvered. Brandeis simply with his great marshalling effects and his great sense of how to run a political campaign, outmaneuvered the insurance companies and convinced the Massachusetts legislature that this would be worth at least a try. He always presented things as an experiment. But all his pro bono work on behalf of the working man had come at a price. Brandeis became an outcast in Boston. His wife and he were no longer included in the most prominent social circles. And Brandeis was not only an outcast, he was now considered dangerous. They find him threatening uh, to everything they believe in. They decide that perhaps uh, he's really a dangerous socialist and uh, uh, a, a revolutionary who is using the law to effect change in society rather than using it to establish order. 
Brandeis' success was extraordinary, and his reputation continued to grow. But he made a point of finding time to relax outside of the office. One of my favorite Brandeis quotes is he would say, I can do 12 months' work in 11 months, but not in 12. And by that he meant people need time, not only throughout the year, but throughout the day, to refresh themselves. And not just him, he thought everybody should have what he would call meaningful leisure, time to reflect, time to enjoy the arts, time for conversation. Time, he did a lot of canoeing, uh, horseback riding, uh, walks, uh, relaxing, because he thought that would refresh the mind as well as the body. Justice Brandeis really did believe not only was that meaningful leisure or freedom something that he should have, but something that everybody should have. Although his mother had died in 1901, other women in the life of Louis Brandeis remained important. He and Alice now had two daughters, Susan and Elizabeth. They had a very warm working relationship as well as a very loving relationship. Apparently, uh, Brandeis was a great family man. It was a good life that they had together. One of Brandeis's strengths was his flexibility of mind and a willingness to change when presented with the facts. The fact that the women around him were so capable, his wife Alice, his sister-in-law Josephine Goldmark, his secretary, Alice Grady, forced him to rethink his ideas about women's suffrage. And it began to dawn on him that if they were so important, if they were worthy of being his colleagues in public reform, perhaps they were worthy of having the vote. My own experience converted me. The insight which women have shown into problems that men do not understand has convinced me that women should have the ballot. It was a woman who led him to an issue which would result in one of the most significant briefs ever written in the history of the Supreme Court. His wife's sister, Josephine Goldmark, came to him about wanting him to do something about women's working hours. It is a very radical step. No brief like this had ever been submitted before. And Brandeis was taking a gamble, but he figured he had nothing to lose. The state of Oregon had passed a law limiting the number of hours women could work in factories to 10 hours a day. Kurt Muller, the owner of a laundry, was fined $10 for acquiring a Mrs. Elmer Gotcher to work beyond the 10-hour maximum. Muller appealed, claiming that such limits were unconstitutional. In 1908, the case reached the Supreme Court, with Brandeis arguing in favor of limiting working hours. This case was specifically about female workers, and Brandeis began with an extraordinary mastering of the facts, any fact which would show the harmful effects of long hours on women, facts which painted women as being inferior to men. His strategy was brilliant, simple, and controversial. If you read Brandeis's brief in Muller versus Oregon, you would come away thinking, this man is an incredible misogynist. He obviously feels that women are second-rate citizens. When I read his brief, I realized this was a major, fine, legal mind at work. It's a radical departure because he really sort of dismisses the law in a page or two. He says, well, that's what the law is, but these are the facts, and this is what you have to take into uh, account here when you're dealing with this. Brandeis wanted to breathe life into the law, to make law which was relevant to society and not just based on legal precedent. To do that, he believed one needed to understand the facts. That, in fact, is what the whole progressive movement was about, what to do about the law so that it would best serve the general welfare in what was seen as a new era, that age of industrialization. Two pages of legal notation, 100 pages of these factual reports that glaze the eye over as you read them. The Brandeis brief became the reformer's brief for almost every major reform afterwards. And if you want to see where it leads, the NAACP brief in Brown versus Board of Education is a Brandeis brief, detailing 
how segregation adversely affects black children. As you read through, you think, why did he write these long briefs? Why does he have so many facts as an opinion, in his opinions? Facts matter. That's why he has them. Facts matter because they help cure prejudice. Brandeis's reputation continued to spread nationally. The former private attorney was now becoming famous as a progressive, fighting for the working class, combating political corruption, settling labor strikes, and curtailing the excesses of big business. This fellow Brandeis is the most dangerous man in the United States. The workers trust him even when he goes against them. Think of it. He tells them they're wrong, he defends the manufacturers half the time, and still they believe him. They're a pretty sentimental lot, the working class, and I think they'd follow Brandeis to kingdom come because nobody can buy him. He's not in this for himself. That's what makes him so damn dangerous. Big Bill Haywood. It would be a congressional investigation into misconduct by a president, which would make Brandeis's name a household word. At stake were coal fields in Alaska, which Richard Ballinger, the Secretary of the Interior, was opening up for mining. Ballinger had previously worked for a big business syndicate, and some conservationists considered him corrupt. A young field agent at the Department of the Interior, Louis Glavis, complained directly to President Taft, who promptly had Glavis fired for insubordination. Outraged, Glavis went public in Collier's magazine with his allegations, and an investigation was held. Brandeis represented Glavis. The often contentious hearings went on for five months. Dear Al, there is nothing for us to do but to follow the trail of evil wherever it extends. In the fight against special interests, we shall receive no quarter and may as well make up our minds to give none. It is a hard fight. The man with the hatchet is the only one who has a chance of winning in the end. When all the shouting was over, Brandeis had caught President William Howard Taft publicly lying about a report on the incident. And what Brandeis did was to show that Taft could never possibly have read this because he traced every minute of Taft's activities, including the time he was on the golf course, when he was here, when he was there. There was no time to read what was essentially a four or 500 page report. Public corruption inevitably disadvantages the poor and the powerless. And what he really felt was terrible was that this was a betrayal of the promise of America made to people throughout the world who frequently took great risks uh, and showed great courage in trying to come to this country, which promised them an equal opportunity. Although he now had a national reputation to protect, Brandeis continued to startle people with his views. In the midst of increasing immigration by Jews into America, he began to support Zionism, the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. But Zionism was out of favor in America. The Jewish community, when they came to this country, I think recognized very quickly that if you identified yourself as racially distinct, that wasn't going to help you here. We see them forswearing a return to Zion and playing down notions of Jewish peoplehood and stressing uh, their patriotism. They were deeply set American patriots, and the idea of being affiliated with another country was just beyond the pale of what they could imagine in their own minds. The vast majority of Amcha, regular American Judaism, wanted to have nothing to do with it. But once again, the prevailing view did not influence Brandeis. The fact that Brandeis would affiliate himself with this was scandalous uh, uh, on its own level, because by the time he's really getting involved in this, he's a very prominent Jew in, in America. Uh, and, and, and given that he hadn't had this deep connection to the religious aspects of Zionism, people were really puzzled. Jews were having difficulty entering America because of increasing restrictions and growing anti-Semitism. Brandeis recognized the need to establish a separate homeland for these people. 
He believes that many of the great ideals that he really wanted to bring about in progressive era America could be realized in this great new society that was going to be shaped in the land of Israel. Despite his close association with Zionism, Brandeis's reputation as a strong political force for reform propelled him even higher. Woodrow Wilson, a progressive, turned to Brandeis for advice on many issues during his presidential campaign, particularly antitrust matters. And when Wilson was elected in 1912 by a slim margin, he toyed with the idea of appointing Brandeis attorney general. But he held off until late in his first term, when he nominated Brandeis to the Supreme Court. By this time, Brandeis is the head of the American Zionist movement, which means in places like New York, with a very large Jewish population, the fact that Wilson is the man who put Brandeis on the Supreme Court is going to carry a lot of precincts. It wasn't altruistic on his part, although you know, Wilson was delighted thought it was the best appointment he ever made. Uh, but there was a lot of hard politics involved in that as well. The fact that Brandeis was a Jew, and one perceived to be a radical, did not sit well with many of the power elite, including his former friend, Henry Lee Higginson. And once he was nominated, he was vulnerable. There's something that he wanted that they could deprive him of. And they had a powerful incentive to do that because they felt if he got a powerful position, he could really injure their interests. So he had a raid against him, the president of the American Bar Association. He had the president of Harvard uh, testifying to how unethical he was. I think the problem was, as one of the attorneys said at uh, his uh, confirmation hearing, the problem is he's smart. He takes a view that's different than the establishment, and he's very successful at it. And that was a terrible combination from their perspective. The six-month-long contentious nomination fight resulted with Senate approval, mostly along party lines. He would serve until 1939. In just about every poll of scholars as to who the, the greatest judges are, they do this for judges as well as for presidents, uh, Brandeis comes in either second or third, second only to John Marshall, and usually either tied or right behind Oliver Wendell Holmes. And these tied in. I mean, his work as a lawyer influenced his work as a reformer. He becomes a Zionist because it involves principles of American democracy, Jeffersonian democracy, that he valued as a reformer. His work as a judge reflects his work as a reformer, as a lawyer. All these things are tied together. Brandeis did remarkable things to the law when he was on the Supreme Court. He did, of course, bring his fact base jurisprudence to the court. He also brought his belief in experimentation. And so he sometimes wrote opinions that seemed to contradict his very own beliefs, and therefore set a model of a justice adhering to his principles, even when the decision that came out of that adherence might not be entirely to his liking. I don't think Justice Brandeis let his prejudices influence his uh, Supreme Court decisions. I think his values certainly influenced them. But his prejudices about whether one policy would be better than another would take a back seat to if a state policy came forward and the state had some basis for it, he would support that, that state policy. How do we remain objective? Well, says Brandeis. I see the problem. The problem is, do not erect your prejudices into principles. That's the problem. Now, what's the answer? I wish there were a single answer, because a judge like Brandeis, and when I think our judges should try to emulate, is trying to sail between what I call, and others have called, the wooden and the willful. If you're wooden, law is divorced from life. If you're willful, you have substituted your own prejudices for what is meant to be an objective document. When he decided, for example, that he would write against the court decision, 
saying that the state of Oklahoma could not limit the number of ice houses in the state. Brandeis said, well, limiting competition might be a reasonable response to an economic situation. I myself might not like that. I myself might not have done that if I were in that state. But it's a reasonable approach, and let's let this experiment proceed. The facts in that opinion are playing the following role. Judge, don't you see that this is a little complicated? Judge, don't you see that there are two sides to this issue? Judge, are you really sure you know the right side? Or isn't it the case that our Constitution leaves up to the states the right to decide this kind of thing through their legislatures, even if they're wrong? That's why he sees uh, government as a teacher, he says and why I think he uses his opinions from time to time to try to point out uh, a lesson about living together uh, in this country and making decisions through government. It becomes an opportunity to help explain uh, what our government is about, and he did that beautifully. We had a home on Cape Cod, and some work would be sent up when there were urgent, when he was on the court. He would have urgent court matters would sometimes be brought to his attention, but most of that time was to spend, his family members would come. I spent time with him, as did the other grandchildren, really every day of our vacation. And grandfather was, uh, the, the man I knew, was in his 80s. He served on the Supreme Court till he was 82. And, but I remember a man who got up early working at his table at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning before breakfast. He asked questions. He had these beautiful, deep, deep blue set eyes, and he focused on you completely so that you knew that he cared. And he, I always have felt whenever I'm in a difficulty and I think about my grandfather, I always think he's smiling on me. He's on my side. He was, in terms of contacts with us, he was very gentle. And I valued this, I think. I, he was obviously respectful of his grandchildren and interested in what they had to say. He would walk into the room, and because he was just so tall and so together and walking so well, he would just dominate the room because uh, he had that wonderful mob of hair on the top of his head until later in his life, so it was, it, you, you really felt the strength when he entered. We shared this experience of, the, of this very difficult period. You saw what Hitler was doing in Europe. My memories uh, uh, are of a um, grandfather not caring to have a radio in his home in Cape Cod and so it was my job two or three times a day to cross the fields about a quarter of a mile and bring grandfather the latest news from the radio. And I took this responsibility seriously, and grandfather called it the Gilbert News Service. There was a degree of, of uh, serenity and calmness without, you know, diffidence or uh, he wasn't taciturn. I never heard him lose his temper. He was a, a, a whole person, completely. It was again a life uh, that made a great deal of sense, had a great deal of calm to it, and a great deal of purpose to it. And as a child, you could feel this. On the occasion of his 80th birthday, the press coaxed Justice Brandeis and his wife Alice to appear in front of their cameras. This photo opportunity provides some rare moving footage of this very private man during his long lifetime. A lifetime which began before the attack on Fort Sumter and which ended on the eve of Pearl Harbor. He believed in human possibilities. He believed that if you give human beings, information, education, and the freedom to develop themselves. 
The sky's the limit. I think his concern for every person, that every person should have dignity, should have regular income, should have meaningful leisure, should have privacy. Those are all things that are extremely well articulated. He remains a prototypical figure in many ways. Larger than life in some, but this is a man whose life reflected everything that happened in this country for almost 100 years. This program has been made possible by a grant from the Savings Bank Life Insurance Company of Massachusetts, honoring the past, protecting the future.